always confused whether it's good afternoon or good evening. I can definitely say good evening tonight. And uh, if you're able to stand, would you join me in standing? We'll sing our first congregational song. Every day with Jesus. Yes, amen. All right, there we go. <laughs> Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is, is Christ. To die is gain. To know his word and, and walk his narrow way. There is no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will. To be to live is Christ, to die is gain. Once my heart was full of sin and shame till someone told me Jesus came to save. When he said, come unto me, he set my poor heart free for me to live, is Christ, to die is gain. There are things that I still do not know. But of this one thing I'm completely sure. He who called me on that day washed all my sins away. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To know his word and walk his narrow way. There is no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after you. You alone, my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You're my friend, and you are my brother, even though you are a king. I love you more than any other, so much more than any strength my shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone my heart's desire and I long 
to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. Alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit heal. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to work. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for another opportunity to be able to get together. I pray that you bless the service. I pray that you bless Trey, Lord. I pray that you give him the words to speak from his heart and give him the words to say, Lord. I pray that you bless the rest of tonight's activities, Lord. May we honor and glorify you, Lord, with everything we do. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, just remind you of some of the announcements again from this morning. Seeing how you'll probably have a little more time after the evening service. Again, if you haven't had a chance to check the cards and the gifts, if you'll go ahead and do that. Or even check the coat rack if you have a coat that's left there. Or if you'd like to look at one of those uh, suit jackets and things that they're yours if, if they fit you, okay? Again, reminding those, again, who are part of the Faith Bible Institute or anybody else in the church who perhaps has seen disc number five, uh, if you would please uh, let us know that, let Misty Misty know that. Uh, we would do have to pay for that if we cannot find that, okay? Uh, speaking of the Faith Bible Institute, again, there's a sign-up sheet back there. If you would like yours made into a spiral notebook, if you'll sign that and get that to Wendy, she'll get that taken care of for you, okay? Unless I'm wrong, let me know about that, but I assume that that's the case. Uh, again, next week is the uh, sort of the start of the new adult Sunday school class, but again, remember that uh, we'll have uh, Brother Eric Barnes will be doing this for this week's Sunday because Pastor Pendle and them will be out of town uh, preaching at another church, and then he'll come back and finish up. His goal, anyway, is to finish up the book of Ephesians. You'll see some other things there. Breakfast uh, Tuesday at 8 o'clock for men if you have that day available. Uh, Wednesday, uh, Big B Coffee for the ladies, counseling ministry again. Wednesday night, regular scheduled services. Uh, again, uh, we will be back to Patch Club on Wednesday nights. And then you see the things coming up for Blast Rally. Appreciate some of those have already signed up. If you could help with the food, uh, we are having hot dogs and hamburgers. So if you the sign-up sheet out there, that would be appreciated. And then, of course, the men's conference as well. Going to Muncie, those that went last year, I know they had a good time. I'd encourage you, again, if you can go, uh, to go this year and try to invite somebody to come along with you. Uh, Pastor Ryan said we're leaving at 530 in the morning, okay? Um, Let's see. Uh, January 20th is the Comets hockey game. Again, you can still sign up, but if you haven't paid me, you need to do that tonight so we can get a check sent out to, so we can reserve our seats together. Also, that is also the, the quiz rally as well uh, for those that are participating in that, okay? February the 8th through the 10th, Teen Snow Camp. If you have any questions, see Pastor Ryan. And then Couples Retreat, again, if you would uh, encourage you to invite you to go to that, if you haven't had a chance to go, it looks like, we're discussing the last minute, but it looks like we might be going to Swan Lake this year. They're offering us a really good deal to go there. So that'd be kind of nice in the fact that it's a little bit closer to home at least, okay? But we're still working out some final details there, and we'll let you know hopefully by next week exactly where we're going and the cost of that as well, okay? All right, I think that's everything. If the ushers are come, we'll go ahead and take up the morning or the evening offering, excuse me, the evening offering. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you so much for loving us and showing that love each and every day. And Father, thankful again for the many blessings you have bestowed upon us. Again, Lord, we just ask that you'd help us to be wise stewards of the monies that you provide. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Your Father in Heaven is a loving, pursuing God, and I think today's story gives us a beautiful picture of that truth. When Dr. R. A. Torrey was president of the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago, he received a letter from a distressed father. The man, a pastor, had a prodigal son named Bill who was breaking his heart. Would Dr. Torrey please let his son enroll at Moody? Dr. Torrey replied that while he sympathized with the man, 
It was not possible to admit the boy. Moody was a Bible school, not a reformatory. The man wrote back, doubling his cry for help. Finally, Dr. Tory agreed, provided the boy meet with him daily and abide by the rules. The arrangement didn't go well at first, and Dr. Tory thought the experiment hopeless. The boy had serious problems and seemed torn apart by them. But he did keep the rules. Day by day, he vented his frustrations to Dr. Tory, and as it turned out, was more attentive to Tory's answers than it appeared. Slowly, week by week, and month by month, Dr. Tory's love was melting the heart of the troubled young man. Eventually, William R. Newell went on to become a much-loved professor at Moody Bible Institute. In 1895, William desired to put his testimony into verse form. The idea rolled in the back of his mind for several weeks. Then one day, on his way to a lecture, the lines came to him. Ducking into an empty classroom, he jotted down the words on the back of an envelope. As he hurried on to class, he happened to bump into Dr. Daniel Towner, director of music at the Institute. Handing him the verses, William suggested they could use a good melody. By the time Dr. Newell finished his lecture, the completed tune was ready. Dr. Towner had been so taken with the poem that he immediately went to his studio and composed a tune. He told the professor that he felt this song would be the best hymn that either of them would ever write. The two men gathered around the piano and harmonized as they sang the song together. Within months, it was published and became a hymn for the ages. Bill Newell went on to become a well-known Bible teacher throughout the Midwest and the author of a popular series of Bible commentaries. He once said that had he not gone through his troubled years, he might never have fully understood the importance of Calvary's grace. So what was the song of this young rebel? See if these words will bring the song to your mind. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Aren't you glad for a God of long suffering? Doesn't give up on people. All right, let's all stand if you're able to. Let's sing at Calvary. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great grace was free pardon there was multiplied to me there my burdened soul found liberty at calvary my god's word at last my sin i learned then i trembled at the law i'd spurned 
Still my guilty soul imploring turn to Calvary. Mercy there was great, grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, that mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Amen. Do we still have one more or is that it? Okay, that's it. Good. All right. You may be seated. All right. All right. I do want to say thank you again for coming out tonight. I know we haven't done this since I've been here. It's a late service for most of us. But uh, you encouraged me and you encouraged Trey by being here tonight. I really appreciate that. Uh, appreciate, I know many of you pray for our college students. Uh, Trey's got some d big decisions to make for the summer where he's doing an internship at. If you'll pray for him about that, he maybe has several opportunities, but he wants to be at the right place where God would have him. So we continue to pray for that. I know he would appreciate that. Hard to believe he only has one more year after this, and he'll be done. So it's, it just seems like yesterday he went off to school. And of course, that's with many of our college students. So they'll be done here in the next year or two, and uh, that's part of life. We're excited for them, what God has for them. But I'm excited. I remember when Trey first came to me and said that uh, God had called him to the ministry. I didn't fall on the floor. I just assumed that that was going to be the case. I just kind of knew that, but I don't tell anybody that God's called them. God has to do that. And he recognized that, and he spent a lot of his summers, obviously, up at Kobe. Actually, we don't get the chance to see him very often. But when he's home in the summer and at Christmas time, we try to give him an opportunity to preach. And we're looking forward to what God has laid on his heart tonight, Trey. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If you take Let's turn to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, and we'll get to verse 38 in a minute. Growing up with siblings, it presents a lot of great opportunities to mess with them a lot. I remember growing up, we went to, I think it was a Pizza King, and we went there, and we were sitting and looking at a table, and there was a bowl of fruit, and I don't know who the, the first person was to pick it up and touch it, but whoever it was, they got the bright idea to try and convince the rest of us that it was a real, like, I think it was a bowl of apples. And so to convince us that it was real apples, and so, like, go ahead and grab it and take a bite of it. And I don't remember how old we were. This was a long time ago. But some of us grabbed the fruit, and we could tell that it was a decoration of fake fruit. And some of us, not going to point any fingers, couldn't tell and thought it was a real fruit and attempted to bite into it. They didn't have the real thing. It wasn't a real apple. You couldn't bite into it. And in preaching this message tonight, I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to go ahead with it after what Pastor preached this morning, but I just couldn't get out of my head about religion versus relation. Do you have the real thing? Having a relationship with God. The song at Calvary, the line that always gets stuck in my head is the mighty gulf that God did span. We could no sooner get ourselves to heaven than we could jump across the Grand Canyon. But God spanned that mighty gulf. Amen. And He did it so that we could have a relationship. Wow. So this evening, 
I want to preach a message called the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 38, And he, this is Jesus, said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. God says a lot in the Bible about what he thinks of religion. In 1 Samuel 15, Samuel tells Saul, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is, an, is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Saul didn't have a right relationship with God, which meant that he thought he could do it his way. Yeah, that's right. In Isaiah chapter 1, God says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he-goats. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Later on in Isaiah 43, he says, Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of thy burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. Then in the next verse, he ends it by saying, Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. Hosea 6, God says, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Amos 5 says, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. And then in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus he says, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Over and over again in God's word, he tells us what he thinks of religion. I hate it. It's an abomination. You weary me with your iniquity. I cannot. I cannot handle it. Then we get to Mark chapter 12. And in Mark chapter 12, we read three verses and then we'll eventually get to the end of the chapter. He deals with three groups of people and how they viewed religion and relationship. The first group that we look at is the scribes. We see the warning of the scribes. Jesus says as He's teaching them, doctrine teaching, He says, beware of the scribes. The scribes were the religious leaders. They were in charge of teaching the law, copying it down, making sure it got passed down. Beware of the scribes. It's a very interesting thing for Jesus to say, but he goes on to describe really how they acted. That's right. They love to go in long clothing and they love salutations in the marketplace and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. Mm -hmm. Now to you and me in our modern day, that doesn't really make any sense. And so I'm really excited about this because I, I love this kind of stuff. I'm going to go through really quick and just explain what all these mean. First of all, they love long clothing. This is referring to an outer robe, an, an ephod of some sort that was reserved for stately, religious, anybody of the sort that was super important. And you could tell by what, clo what coat they were wearing, that's a religious person. That's a, that's a state official. That's somebody high up and important, more important than me. And from what, I've, from what I read and from what I, what I found, the longer that it was, the more important you were. Now to me, I don't know if I want a long coat dragging behind me on the ground because that's just people stepping on it, getting your way, whatever. But the longer that it was, the more important you were. So they would go to the marketplaces and they would go out in the public Amen. and it would drag behind them. Right. And all it was was saying, look at me, I'm more important than you. Yeah. Religion. So first of all, they love long clothing, but also it says that they love salutations in the marketplace. This one was kind of weird. I don't really understand why, but they apparently competed to say hi first. The, the word for greeting is to, to this, this word for they love salutations is to greet one another. And it was great honor to be able to greet someone before they greeted you. And so they would compete. I said hi to you first. Does that really matter? 
ha, I'm better than you, I'm more spiritual than you because I greeted you first. I said hi. I said good morning. Religion over relationship. Then he goes on to the next verse and he says, and the chief seats in the synagogues. Now this one's a big one. Because the seats in the synagogues were for the teachers. They were for the the scribes, they were for the, the people, the religious people that were going to teach. And Amen. the chief seat was the one in the middle Amen. with their back to a model of the ark. Amen. This seat, yeah. to sit in it, was saying, I yes. okay. am a, in the lineage of Moses, not physically, but I am in the spirit of Moses, and I'm here to expound the law. I know the Bible better than you. I'm spiritual. That's religion. But then also it says they like the chief upper rooms. When you go to a party, when you go to a feast, the closer you could get to the host, the more respected you were, the more honorable you were. And so they would fight. I've known him longer. I've known the host longer. I'm better friends with him. I'm related to him. Whatever they could get, whatever edge that they could get to be more popular. Anything that they could do to get closer to the host. Religion, religion, religion. Which devour widows' houses. He goes on to say in verse 40. In this day, women didn't have much legal authority so when their husbands died, they had no claim to the estate. It's just like uh, in the book of Ruth, when Naomi's husband died. She didn't have any claim to the land. That's why Boaz had to be the kinsman redeemer. And so sometimes what would happen is if there was no heir, or even if there was and he was young, they would, the, the husband before he died would make a Pharisee or a scribe or a religious leader, would make them the executor of the will to make sure that his wife was taken care of and to make sure that all this could happen. They devour widows' houses. It's not that hard when you're the executor of the will and the widow has no legal authority to take from her. Enrich yourself and cast her aside and give her just enough to survive. Religion, religion, religion. This one I'm excited for because I don't think my dad's expecting this, but he was giving me a hard time about bringing Greek into it, so <laughs> just for him. Long prayers, making a pretense. Yeah, that's right. I can pray for yeah, 10 minutes right. straight without even stopping. Right. I can pray for an hour. I can pray for, I can go on and on and on and on. And that made me think of the verse in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, and he says, use not vain repetitions. And that word for using repetitions is batalageo, which is stammering words, stuttering, just repeating over and over again. Just like when you have a stutter and you repeat a certain sound, that word is to say the same thing over and over and over and over again to the point of confusion, to the point of, like, we get it, like, why are you repeating yourself? Do you not have anything else that you can say? For pretense, they make long prayers. I can pray... For an hour. I can pray for two hours. I, yesterday I prayed for 24 hours straight. I didn't do anything else. Religion, religion, religion. Yeah. Amen. So he says, beware of the scribes. Then he describes how they are and he gives the end result. These shall receive greater damnation. The word for damnation is judgment. They will receive a greater judgment because they made a pretense, because they devoured widows' houses, because they sought to increase their standing among men, because they sought to have the attention on themselves, because they sought public admiration, because they sought public awards, and because they had a public hypocrisy, they would receive a greater judgment because they were the ones that were supposed to know better. Because they were the ones that had the Bible. And they were supposed to know better. They were supposed to know that they were to take care of the widows rather than try and squeeze every last dollar that they could out of them and give them just enough to survive. They were the ones who were supposed to know that true religion and undefiled is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows. 
They were supposed to know that God doesn't want us to put the focus on ourselves. John said it best, He must increase, but I must decrease. Yep. They were supposed to know that. They, they didn't. And Jesus says, beware the scribes. Then in verse 41, I don't know if he moved, if he was in the same place, how long of a span of time is in between, but the Bible tells us, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. So Jesus is now in the treasury. And the Bible gives us the reason for why he's there. He's there to see how the people are giving, not what the people are giving, how they're giving. It's not until afterwards that the Bible goes in to describe what they're giving, but the very first mention of giving, he wants to see how. He wants to see their heart. So the second thing that we see is the wealth of the rich. He says that they were, he was standing against the treasury seeing how they gave, and many that were rich cast in much. Now, the, the box that they were throwing it into, I'm not sure exactly how big it was, but it was pretty nice size. And usually it was in the shape of a trumpet, and it's usually made of metal. And what happens when you throw metal against metal? Ting, ting. How many of you guys, I'm going to be terrible at describing this, but how many of you guys know you go like a fast food place and you have that, or anywhere, and you got that little thing where you can throw pennies into, quarters, whatever, and you can watch it spin around. It's an old, old, it's an ancient version of that. Made of metal so you can throw money in and you can collect it. And since it's made of metal and they have metal coins, every time they throw a coin in, you hear it. And because it's made in the trumpet shape, that sound is amplified throughout so people know that you're giving. And so rich men are coming in and throwing in much, and I'm not sure how they threw it in, but if I was in their spot and I wanted people to know how good I was, I probably would have a big bag of coins, and I would probably take it out one at a time. I'd make sure people were watching. I'd throw it in and listen to it sound for a minute. And I'd reach in my bag again and make sure people were watching and throw it in. And I'd repeat that process until I got bored, and I would pick up the rest of the bag and I would shake it out and make sure that thing made as big of a thunder as it could up against the metal of the collection box. And I'd make sure the whole time that people's eyes were on me so they could see how rich I was and that I was giving to God and that I was such a good person because I could have kept that money for myself, but I instead chose to give it to God. Yeah. Religion. Yep. Amen. Yep. And I'm sure there were plenty of people around that were looking at the people giving and saying, wow, they're incredible. They're great. They're helping God. They're helping their fellow man. I'm not sure what they would have thought. But Jesus looks at it, and he doesn't say a word. Because they were just looking for that public acclaim. They were just looking for, it's all about me. Jesus came to see how they gave, and he was not pleased with how they gave. They had public pride. They had public selfishness. It says that out of their abundance, they gave. If you have $100,000, it's not really that hard to give 10000 because I still have 90000 left. Out of their abundance, they gave much. It doesn't really hurt me. If I had all the money in the world, it wouldn't hurt me. But then there's a lady that comes in, a widow, and I like to use imagination when I'm reading the Bible. It makes it more interesting. And I like to imagine that the, the, the rich men are making their lines and they're throwing it in, having a good time, talking, laughing, just hanging out. And I like to imagine she's kind of behind them, hidden away, trying to gather up the courage. Maybe goes to walk through the crowd a couple of times, stops, goes back, trying to work up the courage. And then eventually she gets to the point where she's like, I need to give this to God. And she pushes through, or maybe there's an open gap or something that she can scurry through. Goes up to the collection box, tries to make sure no one's looking. 
kind of puts it in on the edge and holds it there and then lets go so it makes as little noise as possible and runs before it's even hit the bottom of the collection. Now, I can't prove that any of that is true. That's just sanctified imagination. But it's not that hard to believe. If everyone around you was throwing in $10,000 and all you had was a dollar, I don't know that I want people to know that's all I had. And she throws the money in, and she's gone maybe, or maybe she's standing there, I don't really know. And Jesus finally speaks. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. He says, disciples, guys, fellas, come here. Did you see that? Did you see that? And they're probably coming over, like, what is he talking about? You know, somebody might have stolen from it. Maybe someone put a lot in. Like they're trying, maybe he's finally acknowledging the rich guys. Guys, guys, come here. I have something I need you to see. To see. Did you see that woman? And they're like, Amen. the one that didn't put anything in? That one? And he's like, I tell you, verily, truly, I say, she put more in. And the disciples, known for understanding what Jesus was talking about, I can imagine them sitting there trying to do the math in their head. He put in 10,000, he put in 10,000, he put in 10,000, he put in 10,000, 40,000, uh, and then she put in two mites, which make a farthing, which is like a dollar. Jesus, I'm not really understanding what you're saying here. Truly I say unto you, she hath put more in. Because the rich men were about religion. Look how good I am. Look how much money I have. Look how much I give. Look how awesome I am. Me, 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 I, I, I. Yep, that's right. And the widow said, God, this is all I have, but it's yours. Wow. Amen. Amen. So the scribes, beware of the scribes. They shall receive the greater damnation. The rich men came. Jesus wanted to see how they would give. And they were found wanting. Verse 44, All they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her wants did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Jesus knew how much she had. It was the two mites. She cast in all that she had of her want. She could have, she could have made the excuse and said, this is all I have. I should go find something to buy, to eat, so that I can survive another day because surely God wants me to stay alive. She could have made any excuse. She could have done anything she wanted with that money, but she instead decided to give it to God and to trust Him with the rest. How could she do that? How could she choose that option? In 1 John chapter 1, the first five verses, John says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. How could the widow make the choice? I would say it's because to her it was about a relationship. John is writing to the people and he says, that which, we have heard, that which was from the beginning, which is how he opens up his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the Word of life. And we know it's a common expression John uses to refer to Jesus. He opens his letter and says, guys, that which was from the beginning, Jesus. Yeah. That's who we declare unto you. Verse 2, for the life was manifested. That's what the Christmas season is about. Jesus came down to earth, was born in a human body so that he could redeem mankind. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. We declare unto you that ye may have fellowship 
with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. John says, I have a relationship with God, and I have a relationship with Christ, and I'm writing unto you so that you can have the same thing. Everyone. Have that fellowship. To John, it wasn't a religion. It wasn't wake up every day and check boxes off. I read my Bible. I prayed. I helped someone today. I gave money. I went to church. Those are all great things. I'm not knocking that at all. All those things you should do. But if you do it so that people look at you and say, that's a great person. If you look at it so people say, what an amazing, upstanding citizen. If you do that so people say, wow, they are getting heavenly rewards. If you do that so people notice you. It's religion, religion, religion. And we read what God has to say about religion. I hate it. I can't stand it. I can't stand your iniquity because it's all about you. Your worship means nothing because it's self-centered. The heart of the matter is that it's the heart that matters. You can look at the the fruit. You can look at the outward all you want. It doesn't matter. You can look as good as you want. You can say all the right things. You can fall in line and be the perfect Christian. It doesn't matter. Growing up in church... You get a really good idea of what it means to be a Christian and you get a really good idea of what a Christian looks like. And it is so easy to slip into looking like a Christian. If we're not careful, we look at the fruit. Yes, Jesus, I love you. Look at what I did for you. Isn't that what Jesus says many people are going to say to him in the last times? Many people came to me and said, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons? Have we not done great works in your name? And his answer to them is, depart from me. I never knew you. Because nothing that they said implies a relationship. Jesus, we we prophesied in your name. Jesus, we did great works in your name. Jesus, we cast out devils in your name. I never believed in you, though. I never asked you to save me, though. I never wanted a relationship. Look past the fruit and get to the root. What is the root? What is the heart? This past semester, I took a class and one of our textbooks was called Shepherding a Child's Heart and the entire book was about getting to your kid's heart and it's not just for kids. Every one of us needs to get to our heart, to examine our heart. Is it a religion or is it a relationship? Why do you do what you do? I've taught the teens a couple times and I think one time that was a a, a thing that I did was why do you do what you do? Because I think it's important for them as they grow up to recognize why do I go to church? Why do I pray? Why do I read my Bible? Because if they don't have that settled right now, when they go out, they're not. But it's not just for the teenagers, guys. It is important for all of you. But it's important for all of us, myself included. Why do I wake up every morning? Why do I go to Bible college? Why do I read my Bible? Why do I pray? Why do I go to church? The heart of the matter is that the heart is what matters. God wants your heart. In conclusion, Mark chapter 12 and verse 28, And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? One of the scribes comes to Jesus and he, he, he feels like he has him stumped. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What's the first commandment? And Jesus looks at him and he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And this is the law and the prophets. The whole entire Bible can be summed up in two sentences. Love God and love others. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God doesn't want outward conformity. That's what breeds hypocrisy. That's the religion. That's what the scribes had. That's what the rich men had. 
was outward conformity, which led to hypocrisy, which led to them trying to make themselves look good. God wants your heart. That's when you choose to give Him all. That's when you choose to be that living sacrifice. That's when you choose to love others. Amen. Amen. Right. The, the matter of the heart is that the heart is all that matters. Religion or relationship. Why do you do what you do? Why do you follow God? Is it so you can mark off another list? Or because you have that relationship? Because you love Him? Let's go ahead and pray. And then I'll turn it over to the pastor for the communion. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for today, Lord. Thank You for this message. And Lord, thank You for Your Word. And Lord, for the fact that You did span that mighty gulf and You did it for mankind to have a relationship. And Lord, that You give us the opportunity to have a relationship with You. Lord, I pray that each and every one of you each and every one here, myself included, would examine our hearts as we go into the new year and that we would come to the, the, the root and that we would have a relationship and not a religion. Lord, thank you for being so good to us. I pray for the rest of this evening that you would help us to honor and glorify you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.